Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Raybould. I'm from the Oxford Protein Informatics Group, and we're based in the University of Oxford. I'm here presenting evidence of antibody repertoire functional convergence through public baseline and shared response structures as part of the 3 d sig COSI at ISMB. And thank you very much to the organisers of the 3 d sig COSI for selecting our work to be presented today. So I'll start by going through a few bits of background information which should make the talk easier to follow. So first is the role of antibodies in the adaptive immune response. So the first step is that we're exposed to an antigen that comes into our bodies. The second is that our baseline antibody repertoire, which sort of acts as our first responder antibodies, a certain proportion of these will be complementary enough to a protein or proteins on the antigen surface to initiate an immune response. But these antibodies won't uh, immediately be of sufficient affinity to clear the antigen. So what happens is that the B cells that encode for these antibodies migrate to the lymph nodes and a process called affinity maturation tailors them to yield stronger, more efficient binders. And after selection, when we end up with an antibody that sufficiently strongly binds the antigen to clear it, we end up with a protective immunity that remembers which antibodies were effective. And a little bit about antibody sequence and structure. So the region that's particularly relevant here is the FV region, or the variable domain. And that's set, uh, encoded over two variable regions, the variable heavy chain, VH, and the variable light chain, VL. And in particular, we focus on the complementarity determining regions, which are the CDR H1, H2, H3, and L1, L2, L3. On the representation on the bottom left of the slide, these are shown as loop regions, and they're most proximal to the antigen and play a key role in determining the complementarity of an antibody for a particular pathogen. Antibodies aren't encoded on single genes. They're actually encoded over several different gene transcripts called the V, D, and J genes for the heavy variable domain, and the V and J genes for the light variable domain. And these can be switched up to create much more diversity. An interesting thing you'll notice is that the heavy one and heavy two and light one and light two complementarity determining regions are encoded on the V gene, whereas the third region is encoded between the genes, which allows for nucleotide insertions and a greater diversity of amino acid sequence and length in the third complementarity determining region. So a common way to analyze antibody repertoires is to use clonotyping. Well, the goal of clonotyping is to derive antibody lineages within the immune response. So these identify antibodies that derive from the same V and J genes and have over a certain percentage of CDRH3 sequence identity. And the idea here is that you can identify expanded clones that will have been selected for from the naive step through the affinity maturation step. Um, and therefore you can identify antibodies that you think are responding particularly to the pathogen of interest if it's after vaccination, for example. It can also be used by comparing antibody repertoires, looking for the same clonotypes and inferring that those antibodies can act in a functionally equivalent way. And beyond just the antibody sequence, you can get a sense of what the antibodies look like in three dimensions by using a homology modeling approach, such as a bodybuilder or repertoire builder. These are crucial if you're going to perform structural characterizations on the scale of number of sequences needed to characterize an immune response. So the investigation that really inspired this study was one performed by Brian Briney in Nature of last year. So what he did was he performed high throughput sequencing on the naive so baseline repertoires of 10 different unrelated individuals, and then he did clonotyping across the VH sequences. What he found was actually that very, very few of these clonotypes were common to lots of the individuals. Uh, this is surprising given that we would expect, in terms of functional commonality between repertoires, much more than 0.022% functional commonality, given that the number of antigens that we come across in common is very high, and there are endemic antigens in, in any particular population. And so what we think is that we are missing a certain proportion just by using clonotyping analysis of functionally equivalent antibodies uh, that, that must exist across people's repertoires. And for example, it's really easy to find antibodies even just in the PDB uh, with very different genetics and fairly low CDRH3 sequence identities that combine to the same epitope in exactly the same way. So here are two antibodies that were identified by Eve Richardson that can both bind to the MERS coronavirus receptor binding domain. Uh, and it's clear from panel A that they're binding with the same binding mode. Uh, but they derive from different V genes and different J genes and have a quite low sequence identity across the H3 region compared to what clonotyping would normally use. Uh, but what is clear is that the geometries of the binding sites are very similar and that the paratope sequence identity, so those are the residues that actually are contacting the antigen, is very high as well. So this got us thinking that rather than clustering repertoires by their clonality, what we could do is 
cluster repertoires by their predicted structural diversity and look for structurally similar repertoire, uh, antibodies that exist across repertoires. And then by using Pareto prediction software, we could, we could actually scan those repertoires of functionally equivalent antibodies that don't have the same genetic lineage. So the tool we use to actually structurally characterize antibody repertoires, we term repertoire structural profiling, and I'll briefly explain how it works. So we consider the heavy and light chain separately. The first step is to see, do we think we can model the CDRs to a sufficient degree of accuracy? If we do, we preserve the sequence. If we don't, then we have to trim it out. The second step is sequence clustering. We have to do this just for computational tractability because the next step involves a lot of comparisons into the billions, in fact. So once we have these sequence clustered modelable CDR uh, chains, we then pair them combinatorily and compare them to the solved FV structures in SABDAB. And if we get a sequence uh, similar enough identity across the interface residues, we determine the interface is modelable and we preserve the FV pairing. So now what we have is a set of FVs that we think we can model to reasonable accuracy. And we have a set of six CDR templates we think we would use to model all the CDRs and an FV orientation template we think we would use to model the orientation. And using a pre-computed distance matrix, we can very rapidly use this information to identify which are the actual distinct structures within our repertoire. So we can map a set of VH and VL sequences onto a predicted set of distinct structures. And here identical structures have the same combinations of six CDR lengths and are within a certain threshold orientation template RMSD and CDR RMSD across the six CDRs. So we applied this method to samples of the naive repertoire taken by Mariah Godoni in Nature from 2019. We picked the 41 data sets that had quite deep samples, so over 100,000 heavy and light chain sequences. And this table shows us going through each step of repertoire structural profiling from the separate VH and VL chains through to the number of distinct structures we identified. And so our most structurally diverse repertoire had over 200,000 distinct structures, going down to number 41, which had only 78,000. What we were interested in here is how many of these distinct structures were actually common across lots of different repertoires. And so we applied a greedy clustering approach, again, based on the predicted templates. So we started with our 209,000 distinct structures from our most diverse individual, and then we considered the next most diverse individual in that order. And from individual two, we looked at all the FVs we think were modelable and all of the associated templates and compared them to the distinct structures we'd already identified in individual one. Now, if a distinct structure could represent an FE from both 1 and 2, in other words, the FE from individual 2 was sufficiently close in predicted structure space to something we saw in individual 1, we identified that structure as public to both individual 1 and individual 2. However, if an FE couldn't be assigned to a distinct structure from individual 1, that was designed as a, uh, defined as a, pu a private structure because we couldn't observe it in every single individual. And so the idea is we can keep comparing lots of different individuals and end up with a set of public structures that persist across all individuals. And to get a sense, because we're looking at the amount of sharing, we wanted a sense of how much we'd expect to see just by chance. And so to do this, we built random repertoires for every real repertoire. Now these have access to the same combinations of CDR uh, lengths, and they also are restricted to only using the CDR H1 and H2 and L1 and L2 templates from the same PDB entry. And this in a way is mimicking the fact that in real repertoires, Antibodies are, are sort of uh, the, the structures of the H1 and H2 are somewhat restricted by being encoded on the same gene. And they were sampled to the same depth as the real repertoire as well, for fairness. And so every row in this table represents another data set added in that long pipeline that we uh, comparison over that pipeline that we showed. And what we're looking at here is are the penultimate two columns of the table. So after we compared the first two most diverse individuals, 100,824 of the distinct structures we identified could be classified as public in the real repertoires. That's about 30% of the distinct structures were public. In comparison, the uh, equivalent random repertoires, only 3% uh, public structures existed, which is a much smaller percentage and implies that real human repertoires are focusing on particularly uh, convergent regions of structural space, which is interesting in and of itself. And then continuing the analysis down to 10 compared individuals, we still saw 27,389 distinct structures that we could assign to every single individual. So that's about 3% public distinct structures over all the distinct structures we saw. And by this point, the number of convergent clonotypes and random repertoire distinct structures are negligible. So this is really exciting and implies that we really can 
access a lot more functionally convergent antibodies if we can find similar enough paratopes across the FEs we think will adopt these distinct structures. And just in the graphical sense here, we have the real repertoires on the left-hand side mapped onto their structural space, and the comparison between all those real repertoires is yielding these clusters that are ringed in black, which are public clusters. The equivalent for the random repertoire, the structures sampled are just so much more diverse in terms of structural space that we don't see this clustering. So using the 27,000 public structures that were seen in all 10 ind different individuals, we built an antibody model library using a bodybuilder. So we actually built the full three-dimensional FV region structure models for these. Uh, around 85% of them were successfully modeled. We don't get complete uh, success here because we considered the modelability of the VH and VL CDRs independently. And sometimes those chosen templates clash when you actually perform the modeling uh, in, in the real sort of FV context. But there were two very exciting results. One was that the human, uh, the templates used to build the um, models in our AML were disproportionately human compared to their abundance in the database, which is implying we're preserving some structure, human structural signal uh, through doing this repertoire comparison. And also we performed an explicit comparison to solved structures of therapeutically relevant antibodies from Therasabdab. Um, and here, 11 of these solved structures were within 0 0.75 angstroms FVRMSD across the same set of CDR lengths to a model in the AML. So we're really close here to therapeutically exploitable molecules that can bind to lots of different antigens. And this gives us encouragement that using these as a structural basis set for general antibody screening could be very lucrative. Of course, this comparison is only across geometries and uh, not, not uh, chemistries that can exist on those geometries. But bear in mind that we have FV sequences from 10 different individuals that we think will adopt all of these different structures. So you can very quickly elaborate back out to get your sequence diversity around these geometrically relevant basis sets. And you can also perform this analysis in a longitudinal uh, NGS context as well. So here we applied our method to some samples taken by Nanita Gupta of three individuals before and after flu vaccination. And so we're looking for two things here. One, what happened to the degree of structural sharing after vaccination? And could we identify structural sharing that was common to lots of different people after vaccination? And crucially, that those structures were different to the things that existed in the same individuals before vaccination. And the answer to the first question is that actually there's a significant increase in sharing after vaccination, which is exciting. What it's implying is that there's a convergent structural drift towards the, the the same selection pressure being the same antigen that's been injected to all these people. And the fact that we're increasing our structural sharing implies that we're converging potentially on similar structural responses. And by comparing the after vaccination to the before vaccination structures for each individual separately, we identified which structures were only present in each individual after vaccination. And then comparing these across all the individuals, we still identified 87,000 structures that could only be seen in each individual after vaccination but were shared across all individuals after vaccination. And we're really excited about using this particular set as a basis for a bespoke antibody model library or screening library for, for example, influenza. But this approach could also be used on COVID-19 repertoires to identify binders to SARS-CoV-2 that are convergent in terms of the fact that lots of people respond with the similar structures. So in conclusion, based on antibody structural clustering, there's far more opportunity for observing functional com commonality than we currently can access just by doing clonotyping experiments. Analyzing naive repertoires allows us to identify this set of public structures, which could be exploited as a gen general uh, screening library against lots of different relevant antigens. And our method can also be applied in the longitudinal NGS repertoire context to pick out similar responses across different individuals. What we are considering doing in the future is to identify a set of representative light chains um, because this will give us access to a lot of VH-only sequencing data that currently we have to leave unharnessed because we're only considering samples of both the heavy and light chains simultaneously for added reliability at this stage. Uh, all the pre-processed data sets we use are available from the observed antibody space database and all the PDB files comprising the two different AMLs, so the public baseline and the flu responding AML, are available from the resources page of our website. And over time, we intend to build more AMLs from all the sequencing studies that are performed in OES. And for further information on this work, there's a preprint on the BioArchive preprint server. With that, I would like to thank my co-authors and my D4 funders, and of course, all the members of OPIC for their continued support. And thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.